Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host of Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual global gathering of phenomenal women and all of you who love them. Yes, you mothers, daughters, grand and great-grandmothers, fearsome and generous, honest and humble, in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. You know, here we dig deep and we come up strong. For those of you joining us for the first time, each month we explore a new theme inspired by you. Yes, I said you. We bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us there are some things that we just don't talk about. But not at this table. And no matter how hard judgment knocks, it cannot come in. Beloved, here we live beyond the wreckage. Every week we experience, educate, encourage, and empower each other. We share some aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. Every week, we start right where we are. I am so excited about how the show is progressing. We are in our ninth month of proof that dreams can come true. Frankly speaking with Tyra G, Tyra G is one of my most precious dreams. I thank God for every remembrance of you and your gifts of ideas, your presence, and your encouragement. Y'all know I can't do this without you, right? You're listening to Fairfax, Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the Internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Should you miss us? No worry. You can catch our podcast on YouTube. Just key in, Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. And if you feel like connecting with me offline, please do. You know how much I like that, right? Email me at tyra at tyragarlington.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song. And for naming it, I'm Listening. You know, we're in the last week of this month's theme, What We Think We Know. Yeah, we have had some interesting conversations, diverse conversations about people coming at this topic through different lenses. We've talked about what we think we know about human trafficking, about changing curriculum in a public school at a state level, and What happens when you get uncomfortable with status quo to the point that you become an entrepreneur? This past week, I decided to play a little bit more with those words, what you think you know. And I thought I'd talk about or listen for how people find out what they know. So this meant I was listening to social media, watching TV, reading books, listening, reading articles, and I came up with what the answer is. People ask questions. So to create our common thought space for today, I'm going to give you a report on some of what I've learned. And then it's going to be up to you to look into your own knowledge mirror. First thing, I love this one. The following conversation grabbed my attention. William Friedkin, director of the 1972 movie, The Exorcist, was discussing on public radio yesterday the topic of possession and exorcism. He had not seen an exorcism at the time of the film. It was his fantasy. But he's making a documentary now, and he asked permission. Could he not only observe but film an actual exorcism? Finally, he received permission. First thing he mentioned was it scared him to death. But, Afterwards, the questions, what is it? He interviewed several seasoned brain surgeons and psychiatrists and asked them, what does this mean? Listen to this answer, and I quote, we don't know. To my astonishment, psychiatry now recognizes possession as something called disassociative identity disorder, demonic possession. The doctor who was head of the UCLA hospital said to me, and I'm still quoting, Now, just because we don't know about something doesn't mean it didn't happen. I'm going to repeat that. 
just because we don't know about something doesn't mean it didn't happen. I continue my quote. There are many things like radioactivity that we knew nothing about for the longest time. And now it has a name and a feel of study. And maybe someday they'll find some medical or other term for possession. The surgeon said again, I just don't know. My question to you is how often do you say that? In his book, Beyond the Obvious, mentor and coach Phil McKinney recounts that in 2007, excuse me, 2007, four psychologists observed four children interacting with their caregivers for 200 hours. The children asked between one and three questions per minute. So by extrapolating this data, they projected, they projected, these children would ask 40 thousand questions between the ages of two and five. I don't know about you, but I had I had some rugrats, and I remember the why because mer- merry-go-round. Why because? Why because? And eventually, just because I said so. Well, my question to you is who's answering today? Who's answering our children? And what about the quality of the answers? You know, we grow up getting clues as to what we should be from significant others in multimedia images and stories. As you've heard me say many times, we begin in a once upon a time and have a goal of living happily ever after. So when we're asking kids what they want to be, they're coming from a place at that age of what they think they should be. Yeah, what they should be. At Three to ten years old, 30%, 37% of children say they want to be superheroes. And we buy them lavish costumes. We encourage their superpower. And we pray that they don't try to jump off a building. But somewhere in our teens, we stop asking questions. The last thing I want to share with you is an article I read by educator Katrina Schwartz. And I like this one. She believes, for students at least, The question is more important than the answer. I quote from her. In a traditional classroom, the teacher is the center of attention, the owner of knowledge and information. Teachers often ask questions of the students to gauge comprehension. But guess what? This is a very passive model. It relies on the students to absorb information they need to respond on tests. It's regurgitation. She asked the question, what would happen if the roles were flipped? And children ask questions. Her conclusion is coming up with the right questions involves vigorous thinking through the problem, invigorating it with various angles, turning closed questions into open-ended ones, and prioritizing what the most important questions are to get to the heart of the matter. On the teacher's part, she becomes a facilitator and not not an instructor. Okay, so when we flip the script, finally we can adapt to the American culture, the concept of the future self. It drives us to improve, become a richer, more successful, happier version of who we are now. It keeps us from getting blinkered by the world we grew up in, allowing us to see into other potential worlds, new and different concepts, infinite other selves. It's your turn now to look into your knowledge mirror and find out how you know what you think you know. After our break, you're going to meet a man who has become my friend. I actually am in an organization and see him every Thursday morning for a 7.30 morning meeting. And over the past few years, I call myself knowing him. You know, the question is, who do you think you know? And I heard him make a presentation, and I I just discovered that I didn't know him at all. I was delighted with the new information. I'm going to give you a teaser now. He describes himself as autodidact. Oh, did I do that? Autodidact. That was hard. Let me do it again. Autodidact. I'm not going to spell it for you. For me, I translate that into he's a renaissance man, and he loves to learn. Bottom line, he's going to provide you with a story today you don't want to miss. I've heard a lot of what he's going to say before, but I can't wait to hear it again. You stay close now. And we are back, so let's talk. Welcome, Bill Knapp. Thank you. Um, I want you to do something for me. 
Okay. I have been asking each of my guests to speak to my multicultural and intergenerational audience as if you were a best-selling book. Mm, Okay. And what I want you to do right now is to talk about the prologue of your story and tell it like it's a page-turner, and we don't want you to stop. Hmm. All right. I guess it starts with... In 1960, when my sister and I and my mother moved into one house and my dad into a different one, um, there began a journey, if you will, that would kind of define everything that I wanted to do. Um, Growing up with a a single mother, a school teacher, it has its advantages and disadvantages, um, you learn a lot. You learn how to learn. Um, The journey kept going through the regular school channel things. Um, Fell in love with taking pictures in high school. I became the Ferris Bueller of our high school with over 5,000 students, so it was a full-time job. Uh Um, And as there I learned to do some of the things that I would pursue both as an avocation, as a vocation, and as um, something else. I learned to love to cook by watching Graham Kerr on television. Uh And I just thought that was the most amazing thing. So he was on in the afternoon before my mom got back from school, but after I did. So I was always, um, well, let's just say the uh, chemistry came very much into it at the time, too. But... Sometimes I would have dinner ready, and sometimes I would not. Um, I learned to ski at the ski club with a bunch of friends. And I said before, I learned to take pictures. And those kind of started things going. Cooking became a, a, an avocation, a vocation. I trained as a chef um, in Detroit, and one day... During college, thought it would be a great idea to go out to Colorado to be a ski bum. <laughs> um, I thought it was a good idea. Uh-huh. Um, nobody else in my family thought it was a great idea, except my dad, because it was his best friend whose lodge I was going to be the executive chef at. So oh. I got to be an executive chef at a ski lodge in um, Winter Park, Colorado, and got to be a ski bum at the same time. So you got a two for one. I I did. Actually, and unlike most ski bums, the Ferris Bueller in me came out. I got paid to be a ski bum. Wow. Albeit not that much. But nevertheless, you get to ski every day and then go back and make a wonderful dinner for people. I went later on um, into the restaurant business, worked for a group out of Holiday Inn, rescuing hotels and restaurants mm-hmm. with a couple of other guys. And it's there where I met my wife. Well, she was um, going to be a waitress at one of my restaurants that I was going to fix. And the theme was going to be all of the servers had to have a talent. They were going to be the entertainment. So everyone had to audition. We had magicians and singers and (laughs) piano players and all number of of, uh, interesting people. And she was a music student at the time Mm -hmm. and also studying mathematics, of which she is rather gifted at. Um, she got mad at me because I kept her waiting for an hour and a half. Um, I'd be mad at you too. Yes, and I I gave her the job only because she's like six foot tall and was gorgeous and I would be stupid if I didn't. And she was also really good at it. Uh, One thing led to the other. We ended up together. And then one day my sister called and said, Bill, are you done with the restaurant business yet? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Because you know it's going to kill you. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. How would you like to be the cook on a wagon train? Say it again. How would you like to be the cook on a wagon train? Now, Bill, just, okay, I I want the audience, this isn't TV, I want them to visualize what happened to you emotionally, spiritually, what was on your face when she said that to you. Hello, who is this, and what did you do with my sister? (laughs) Um, She had already gone to work for this group um, about three or four months earlier. 
and they had um, had a problem with the cook before, uh-huh. um, and the uh, so she said to the guy that was in charge, says, "I think my brother might do this," and. I said, okay. So she calls, and, and I said, really? She goes, yeah. I said, seriously? I mean, tell me, tell me about the uh, wagon train. What, what, what? Are, they, are they red? Do they have wheels? I don't get it. She goes, no, mules, wagons, covered wagons, horses, uh, you know, welcome to the Wild West type thing. Uh-huh. And I go, y- you're serious? She goes, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I went back to, she was not yet my fiancé. But Rayanne and said, I'm going to go and uh, work with my sister and be on a wagon train. And she wouldn't open the door. Um, but said, okay. And I said, yeah, and you can stay here and live in my apartment and you can have my car and all nine yards. And I left for a wagon train and went to Pennsylvania in March, um, where it was still winter, uh, mid March. And I do remember vividly the first night there. This is one of the impact or the, the camps that you go into to train to be on a wagon train or to uh-huh. earn your way to it. Okay. It takes um, about four months of living in what we used to call wilderness camps at the time, mm-hmm. in teepees, sleeping, you know. Uh, now, the teepees were up on platforms, and there was a furnace in them, but that was it. And there's probably 12 to 15 people um, in a teepee. And I was quite convinced after hauling my stuff down the mile trail to where this camp was that the person I was sleeping next to, who was a um, a very large uh, young man, was going to murder me in my sleep and run away. So I stayed awake all night looking at him. He and I became pretty good friends over the months and uh, that followed. But And I eventually told him that story, and he laughed until he cried. Um, if you ever have seen the movie The Green Mile, yeah, I uh, remember John Coffey. Yes, I do. That was his name, and that's what he looked like. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it was amazing, and I just knew he was going to. Uh, there was there was a tent stake or something somewhere around. It was just going to throw into my forehead, and then he'd be running off, and I'd be done. Now there there are there are tapes somewhere in the back of your head. Oh yeah, that set that up for you, which we're not going into now because okay. the one thing you didn't say the the hook is what kind of wagon train was this? It was the kind of wagon train that um, the treatment, it was a treatment facility for chronic and um, what was considered at the time unreachable juvenile delinquents. All right, so now you're going to cook. I'm going to cook on the road for um, upwards of 70 um, chronically juvenile delinquent youth um, with probably 50 staff, 75 horses, 16 wagons, 25 trailers, and nine trucks. Okay. And me. All right. Now, I, I, I'm for, the, for the audience, I watched a movie mm-hmm. on this particular. The name of the company? Was Vision Quest. Vision Quest. Still is. And I was so impressed, and I, I want Bill to really walk into some of the things that I learned, so he can tell tell us firsthand. Um, there were some miracles that happened along the way, and mm-hmm. I have to personalize this because I was a principal for a while uh, at a school where every child there had been adjudicated from age 10 to 18, and mm. I, I understand a bit of the culture and, and the mountains that had to be climbed. But tell us, okay, tell us about the philosophy of Vision Quest. Vision Quest um, started as a dream of uh, two men and a woman who was was that you can't give up on kids. Yes. Because if you do, then they're going to give up on themselves, and then that never ends well for anyone, uh, particularly the kid and for those people around them. Um, They take it out. And he decided that the the best way to reach these kids, if you want to be the technical part of it, is called milieu therapy. We're going to approach your problems in a way that you have never had them approached before. Right. Okay. By helping you work through them. As, as we say in that one film, I, I can't change the past. Right. What happened to you happened to you. Right. Um, and I and all of the, you know, if, if we jump ahead, some of the kids I used to counsel says, no, I don't expect you to get over it. Um, I just expect you to get through it. Exactly. <laughs> and exactly. then and then get past it. Because right. if you carry this with you 
for the rest of your life, then it's going to define what you do forever. Absolutely. And if you don't, well, then you don't. Yeah. And um, one of the, and I'm glad you said that because that was one of my favorite quotes. You know, you can't carry it with you. It's the past. Mm -hmm. You have to invent the future now. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Um, One of the counselors was saying, so often when they're new, the students will say, well, how far do we have to go? And his answer was, as far as we need to to get there. Oh, yes. And that was metaphorical as well as literal. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, these kids, the kids that were in the film, many of them had been abused emotionally and physically and had lost all trust. And so what was the way that they helped them walk back into a space called trust? Slowly. Um, first off, uh, the part that didn't show in the film is that there is a very strong ethic involved between the adults who are in charge uh-huh. and the kids who are not. Okay, gotcha. Period, end of story. Okay. Vision Quest is a highly physical program. Mm-hmm. Um, we would, in times, physically confront these kids mm-hmm. to the point where it reminds me from your opening statement. It looked like an exorcism. You mm-hmm. began to lose control. I will, if I have to, hold on to you mm-hmm. on the ground mm-hmm. while you act it out. Okay. Because you got to get it out. Right. Because we're right. not going to get past this point until you get this out. And if we have to do it every day, all day, for the next every day, then we will. Because I'm not giving up and you're not getting out. Now, what you just said, oh, this is so perfect, Bill, because I heard one of the students on the film talk about his horse mm-hmm. and there was a parallel story oh, yeah. that the the horses mirrored what was going on with them psychologically and physically so if they were acting out their animals were acting out oh absolutely and acting out animals are dangerous animals yeah acting out kids are dangerous well, kids talk a little bit about some of the things that you saw happen with that we um if you if you showed enough initiative if you will and, and could be t- depended on mm-hmm. you were given care of an animal okay now if you picture yourself as an inner city kid being given the care of a uh, 1100 pound mule it is frightening yes um because you can't intimidate an 1100 pound mule mm-hmm. you can't manipulate it um you can't there's nothing you can do to it that's going to do anything other than annoy it mm-hmm. so you have to learn to form a relationship with it right and if you do it will begin to trust you and it will do things um it will pull that wagon and if it really trusts you it will kill itself doing that um, wow and that sometimes is is the depth of the relationships that these kids can uh, develop with their animals we saw that with the the mules where they would come in and out but one of the more interesting programs and one of the wagon masters you talked about ran what we call the Mustang train. Okay. And I'll be very brief. The Mustang train started with Tom White, that curmudgeonly old man that uh, he he arranged for us and myself and Rayanne, we were married at the time, mm-hmm. to go out to Wyoming with the Bureau of Land Management and take possession of 70 wild Mustangs. Okay, <laughs> I know. I'm sitting here waiting for the rest of this story. Well, we get these. Well, th- with their help, we get these seventy wild mustangs, um, all gelded, and onto tra- two trailers and drag them out to Arizona, where we have built a uh, a facility to handle them. Okay, and gar- and gathered up a number of young men who were particularly um, wild. These are. They usually had a history of violence along with all of their other criminal activity. And the idea was we're going to take a wild horse and a wild kid and we're going to put them together. Okay. And they're going to adopt each other and they're going to figure out each other and they're going to learn to get along with each other. And then at some point in time, the wild horse and the wild kid are going to cancel each other out and he or she is going to take that animal out on the road for several hundred miles as a wagon train horse. Okay, so now the <laughs> assumption is that this is going to work, but we know there's some dependencies. What has to happen for that to work? I well, I'm not. What it has to happen is that the people who surround the boys okay. have to convince them that they can do it. Okay, that's number one. That's well, that's the biggest one. Okay, that, um, and first you have to be able to approach the animal and not be afraid. 
I have to take your I have to be able to be sensitive to your fear but keep pushing you past it because that animal sitting there in the pen on the other side of the fence is just as afraid as you are. Okay, so now we have the staff and I know they interviewed several staff in oh, the yeah. film. It's up to them to encourage and empower. Mm-hmm. And uh, so does that mean sometimes they are showing or going with the person that has, the young person that has to uh, build a relationship with the Mustang? Or how? Oh, all the time, because um, this is not a, um, this is not a, I don't know, how do you put it delicately? This is not an entirely safe situation. That's what I was getting ready to ask. Okay. So, yes, there are people who are within literally inches of this these boys is okay. getting into it saying All right. do this do that don't do the back up don't back up don't be afraid if okay. you're not afraid this animal is going to sense that as you'd mentioned earlier they begin to mirror your feelings and then the first thing you learn to do is touch it and it learns to be touched wow and it learns to be touched and then it, then you do the kind of touch that it likes horses for whatever reasons and i'm not much of a horse person uh-huh. um they love that br- grooming and brushing. You know, and that was a lot of the, every time they, they were talking to young that. people, <laughs> they were brushing and grooming oh, and yeah. brushing. And, and the horses were over here, a little bit yeah, over they, here. Yeah, more to the right, more to the left. Yeah, yeah, but, okay. <laughs> um, but they, they, and now they're learning to be touched. And they okay. recognize you. I mean, you know, uh, Tom would tell us that the, you know, a horse is as dumb as a stone, but it at least recognizes you when you walk up. Okay. And it will let you touch them. And then eventually it'll let you put something on their, your back. Uh-huh. Um, usually a blanket to start with. Okay. And then you before that all happens, it learns and you learn to lead it around by a halter. And you just walk around. And you do that for days while it gets used to you and you get used to it. Mm-hmm. And you lead it over to the water so it can drink. And you lead it over to some food so it can eat. And all of a sudden it sort of associates you with, oh, wait, food, water, and getting my back scratched. Does it Meeting get, my needs, does yeah. Does it get better than this? Right, I don't right, right. Think so. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, one day you throw something up on my back, and I look over at you. The, my ears twitch. I'm saying, "Yeah, I'm not sure about this." And it's just a blanket. Uh huh. It's just a blanket, just just to get used to it. And that goes on for a couple of days, and then it's not a blanket. Then it's a saddle, and they have a little problem with that. Yeah, yeah. And then um, comes the day. Mm. <laughs> the day. The day. The day. You I, I, do you trust your animal? Yes. Does your animal trust you? Yes. And son, get up on it and let's see what happens. Wow. Okay. And you know what? More often than not, not very much. So <laughs> that that is, if we would say, like that's an exci- inciting incident. Oh, yeah. That young person has learned tremendous amount about mm-hmm. himself. Now, if he gets through the process, that's a huge benchmark, right? Oh, for absolutely. Him? Just just sitting up there. I'm, okay. I, and and. and at the time, this would I, you know I would come into the program as the kind of the older guy and say, "Look, do you, do you realize that in the last uh, four weeks you went from being deathly afraid of this animal, yeah, to sitting on its back? How did that happen? Yeah, what 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 happened? Well, he says, yeah. Well, now let's tell me your story. Okay, <laughs> and then and and that was one of the other things that um, the film taught me was once they were able. Mm-hmm. To build that relationship, they were able to transfer that trust mm-hmm. to counselors, and they began to talk about what happened to but them. It's, it's because we were always there. Yeah, and we were the ones that set the boundaries. Okay, and when we're the one, and when the boundaries become um, dependable, mm-hmm. um, absolutely dependable, then then you can begin to trust because mm-hmm. it's when boundaries are not dependable. Yeah, we have found that the that the kids will lose all trust. And and they some of the phrases I picked up was both camp accountability mm-hmm. and group accountability. Mm-hmm. And apparently, it's a family feeling mm-hmm. that some of these children have never known. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were divided up into um, well teepees they were called. Okay, and and each teepee would have probably ten kids in it, um, maybe. 12, depending on how many kids were around. Mm -hmm. And it was always the same. And you had the same um, staff with you. We called them house parents, believe Mm -hmm. it or not. Um, Because what we did when we hired people is, is I'm not hiring you to be a counselor. I'm not hiring you to be a um, a therapist. I'm hiring you to be a parent. 
Okay. I want you to parent these kids. I want you to take all that on. Mm-hmm. Well, what makes you think I'm good at it? They would ask me. And I said, you're here. You survived your childhood successfully. Which okay. means you were well parented. You already know what to do. Okay. Let's just help you do it for somebody else. Absolutely. Now, I, I want everyone to understand that I want you to talk about the length of a train mm-hmm. uh, experience. I want you to talk about the fact that they are in school. Mm-hmm. We want people to understand that, trying to make it as regular to what the world looks like. In a, yes, in, in, in its quasi-make-believe way, um, we wanted it to be regular. But there's a couple of things that, that as you mentioned, that the metaphors would come out. Okay. Um, a Vision Quest experience was measured in years, not in months. Right. I, um, at the, towards my end of my tenure with them, was the one of the people who interviewed kids. And I told them that I need from you a personal commitment that you're going to spend at least a year with me. Because mm-hmm. they always know how long before I get out. I said, I can't answer that. That's going to be up to you. Okay. I think it's going to take at least a year. Surprise me and do it in less. Okay. Um, kind of a thing. And they said, well, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this. And I said, you have to tell me you're going to. Mm-hmm. Because I won't They can't it. start, right? Yeah. And just, how they you, are there once they say yes. How you end something is how you begin something. And so the court has recommended this for child B mm-hmm. uh, for your program. Mm-hmm. So the court has done some assessing as well prior well, to yeah, that they, point. Well, they have they, a little bit. They have actually just done an adjudication. And then they said, and we are sending you to the Vision Quest program because you really didn't get to us until you'd gone through the other schools, the, gotcha. the, the schools, the uh, group homes. the. Uh, so this the, is the last resort. This was the end of the line. Gotcha. This is, okay. this is where um, if you don't make it here, then you're going to be looking at doing a long time in the day room. All right. Okay. So um, the other thing, um, I wrote down two words, positive strokes, always, mm-hmm. even in correcting. Mm-hmm. They, you know, like you didn't do this or da 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 da. Oh, by the way, you did really well on that. Mm-hmm. So they had something. Uh, it at the end of the, at the end of the ride, um, the wagon master and whoever was the trail master at the time would would stand up there, and you saw us sit up there on their horse and and first give out a co- big congratulations. Hey, we made it off the road. Mm-hmm. Everyone's here. Everyone's safe. Mm-hmm. Um, give yourselves a big hand, and they would. And so, yeah. Um, you guys were great with keeping your distance. Nobody lost control. The scouts did a great job controlling traffic. Walkers, you never slowed the train down. Uh, all in all, this was a great day. Um, however, and then there would okay. be a couple of, of and, you ne- and you never balanced them. You just put two of the big points in you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. type of a thing. You guys need to work on kind of staying in line here. We were drifting all over the road. That can be a problem. Let's do better tomorrow. Okay. Now, there, there's this, I think, is my favorite quote. Um, Only so many things you can put into language. This is true. And I love that. Because they were saying, well, how do you do this? And, they, you know, like a lot of it we got to show. Mm-hmm. A lot of it they have to feel. We can only tell them so much. So, uh, yeah. No, oh, I can't. I, 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 I cannot give you a book that tells you how to drive a team of horses. No, I, I don't want I, a book. I can show you <laughs> how it's done uh, once, and then I'm going to put the reins in your hand and sit next to you. And um, as Mark said, I'm going to keep teaching you until you get it right. Yes, I like that one. I like that one. Now, were you in the wagon train that crossed the Golden Gate Bridge? No. Okay, but you heard about it. Oh, yeah. Um, I noticed, well, several places where they would go through cities and towns Mm -hmm. and people. would, And I was surprised. New York City. Yep. The Grand Tetons. Mm -hmm. San Diego. Yep. Where did you go? I was at, I went to Key West. Okay. And um, I was with the program in a different capacity at the beginning. I was still in the camp, but I did go out to meet the wagon train as it was in New York City. And they parked, they camped in Central Park. Really? Yes. And it was very strange because we're sitting at one end of the park. Um, I'd never been. How many York wagons City. in? Uh, there were 14 in okay. that train. Um, I had never um, been to New York or Central Park at the time. Uh-huh. And I'd driven in there from uh, the western Pennsylvania, and they, uh, you could hear music at the other end of the park. And I go, what's that? And, uh, you know, the wagon master's going, um, that's Simon and Garfunkel. 
Wow. That was their free concert. And we're at the other end of the park. And he says, should we go and listen to them? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> you did, right? Oh, yeah, we got everybody in a big circle, and we got them all, you know, let's go a little closer so we can hear more. Now, the kids were not as much into it as some of the staff because, right. you know, that's... They, had other, they, they had other kinds of music, They had yeah. other kinds of music that interest them. But the fact that... And here's the part that that's, is so interesting and that, that drove it home for me. And my tenure with the Wagon Train was, was one of several different programs in Vision Quest. But when you're on that wagon or when you're on that horse and you ride through a town, mm-hmm. you left a town where you were a pariah. Where you were not welcome, where you were incarcerated right, for the right. way you acted, for the way you thought, for the things you did. Uh-huh. Now you're on a horse or on a wagon going through a town not that far away from where I used to live where the town folk are coming out to applaud you yeah, and to recognize the wonderful things that you're doing now. That's a lesson that's uh, it, it, every day we would try to point out to them. It says, you're not, you're not the, uh, the bad boy here. You're the good guy. Yeah. And those towns that you talk about, those little towns, invariably they would come out and give us stuff. Um, pizzas, <laughs> um, which were never, you know, turned away. Yeah. Um, soft drinks, which we did. Um, coats, jackets, hats, we had a... Uh, they were a, celebrating They you. were. They were celebrating. That's exactly... That, uh, thank you. That was the word I was looking for. You, when you were, When you left the detention center... It was with your head down, shuffling your feet in chains. Yes. Here, four months later, you're getting applause and being celebrated. Wow. What changed? That was my question to them. What, what's different now? How did this happen? And, okay, okay, we're going to take a break. Okay. A couple of minutes. Okay. And uh, if I do this right, here we go. And we are back with my friend Bill, and we are having a fabulous conversation. We're going to run out of time. Um... We're talking about a wagon train, Mm -hmm. a very special wagon train. Uh, It's clients, it's participants, it's students are all adjudicated. Mm -hmm. And the wagon train is a place of last resort for them. And so it's always a challenge. There was something else I got from the film that I watched. And it said, it asked the questions, what's the role of the animals? And the answer was the animals provide work for the students. Mm -hmm. They have to feed them. They have to groom them. They have to doctor them. They have to clear their hoops. So I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about kids today. You know, they'd be on social media and all. I'm thinking, a year. What did they do besides school and take care of the? Did they miss all the things that the external things that came into them all the time, like TV? But when they interviewed some of the students, they said, this is so much better than sitting in a room watching TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the the thing I want you to talk about, they said every trip has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I mean, that's obvious. Well, it's obvious. And and, well, there's also the metaphor of it. That's what I want you to know. When when you came to a wagon train— um, you were the new person, and mm-hmm. you weren't allowed to much do of anything because it is not a cushy environment. Um, those right. animals can be dangerous. Um, we're on the roads. We're riding. It's the weather. Um, but you had already learned at the beginning part a, cer- a certain sense of self-reliance mm-hmm. by com- uh, completing the quest program where you went out on a 21-day wilderness adventure. Okay. And... Um, which was very grueling and, and got you to do things and realize what kind of strengths you actually have. But it also kind of got you to understand how to depend on the people next to you um, in a way that you don't have to um, do anything other than depend on the fact that they're going to be there mm. and that you're going to be there when they need you to be there. And you begin to learn your way around the wagon train. You get to learn the animals. You don't get your animal the first day. Mm-hmm. Um, it may not be the first month. You mm-hmm. may have, you're going to work your way up to it. Um, being a wagon driver is means that wagon is a sense of possession. That's yours. Everything that happens to it, anybody that rides on it is up to you. Okay. And you are the one that decides um, how the maintenance is going to be done, who is going to do it, what it's going to look like, and with with proper teaching, I mean, you know, you don't 
have them do it wrong. But uh, it became a sense of possession, much the same as the horses became a sense of possession, is that when you got your horse, that was your horse. Mm -hmm. Um, Nobody could do anything to it other than feed it except you. No one was going to groom it. You had to take care of it. But you also got to decide who could ride it and when, if any. And I'm thinking as I'm listening to you, okay, yes, we're teaching ownership. We're teaching them accountability. Well, we're teaching them parenting. And parenting, yes, yes, yes. We're teaching them how to deal with something that is utterly dependent on you, kind of like a little kid. And some of the guys said, you know, this is like my kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, you know, it really is. It truly is. They're bigger than you, but they need you to survive. They do. And and there's nothing they can do for themselves. Um, So it it is like having a small children, child that weighs 1,100 pounds. Jeez. um, And that um, might kick you, but very often will not. Yeah. Um, One of the jokes on the wagon trains, what's the difference between a a horse and a mule? Well, they'll both kick you, but a mule will aim. Oh, dear. Okay, that's good. That one's good. That one's good. There are a couple of other things I don't want to leave uh, unsaid. Uh, First of all, the students are Mm co-ed. And one of the things that I took particular notice of in talking about the females, Mm -hmm. uh, the hardest thing for them was not to manage the physical task. The hardest thing for them was to manage the psychology Absolutely. of becoming a woman. Mm-hmm. And the female counselors were there to help them because what we know about them getting into circumstances was not teaching them tenderness, was not teaching them that they were worthy. So they had to unlearn mm-hmm. the sickness and be introduced to a positive psychology of worthiness well i had to learn the that their abilities are um are the same yeah because they've been taught i and i'm going out on a limb here a lot of them have been taught to be victims oh yeah no and, i that's and, what i was trying to get to. they're not and, and we kind of unvictimized says no you, you you got your wagon you got your horses you're not you're not any better you're not any worse than the boys next to you and yeah you can do this of course you go well i'm just a girl well okay you're just a girl and you're still going to do this yes <laughs> yes and you're going to do it the right way and you're going to do it at par and at speed with all the guys next to you. And I think what is not clear often is those kinds of conversations, at least it was at my school, was the first time they had been given permission Mm -hmm. to be other than victim. Mm -hmm. And the role models in their homes, if there were any, generally had a victim tag associated with it. Absolutely. So for me, the breakthrough, I only had 14 girls out of 800 students, But the thing was to allow them to understand that they were. Oh, absolutely. And and I would say between that and the OCEAN programs was the other one I was involved in, that um, we take it um, one more step. Tell me. Not only do you have permission, now I expect you to be better. Yeah, yeah. and, and, And you would be surprised, as I'm sure you're not, but many would be, is that was the biggest challenge of the wagon train and of the ocean quest and of the camel quest and the buffalo soldiers and the myriad of other programs is mm-hmm. is the kids, regardless of their background, regardless of what they have done and what they may have done, will rise to expectations. Yes, yes, if yes. Placed in front of them. And the thing that, as as an educator, and I have been a principal as well as a teacher, and I always said this to the new teachers. I said, expect them to be better than the way they came absolutely and these kids are just like yeah i can do it i can do it let me try let Let me me, let me do it let me do it and and the other thing i taught them when i was doing other programs first thing i'm going to teach you is how to fail yes i will teach you how to win absolutely and what i want you to do quickly is you mentioned the ocean programs Mm -hmm. talk about this one i was fascinated with so i I, you know, used a little authority, and we spent the show talking about this. But talk about the other opportunities you had in the Quest program. Oh, I I was involved in the ocean program off and on because of what I did. In our ocean program, we had, at one time, up to three large tall ships, and we would take kids sailing for six months. And what you learn sailing, and the long and short of it is, you learn to depend on the person next to you in an absolute way. But more importantly... You learned that authority is not there to ruin your life. 
It might be because the guy's the captain or the woman is the captain because she knows more about everything on this boat than you do. And your job is to learn from her. And they do. And um, it was that was a program that was primarily for kids who were adjudicated dependent as opposed to delinquent or perhaps delinquent for um, process crimes, um, things like uh, uh, petty larceny and what have you. These were not violent children. Okay, so that's what... Adjudicated dependent. Mm -hmm. You become adjudicated dependent, and that would mean the court would now take uh, custody of you, and okay. you would end up in a group home or someplace. Like, or if you were lucky, you got to come on to Vision Quest, go to one of those uh, impact camps for a while, and if you made it, you went into the ocean program where you learned to sail. Now, give us a hint of how big one of those ships might be. Um, the small one was 131 feet, and the large one was about 180. Mm hmm. So they're not small boats. We had probably How about tall? How uh, many stories? Well, the masts would go up, uh, I think, 96, 97 feet on the one, the, the big one, which we didn't own. We kind of rented that one. Uh -huh. uh, a little over 100. Um, the boat sailed from, the big one sailed from Hawaii to Detroit. Wow. The other ones would sail up and down the East Coast from Bahaba, Maine, all the way down to Key West, Florida. I just I I find it amazing and thrilling, and I just wish there could be a proliferation of these programs, you know. Because for me, the kids can walk away knowing they can do something that somebody else they know could never do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they need that. They need that to to infuse themselves back into a society and feel worthy. Me again, feel worthy, feel worthy, feel worthy. Okay, you've got. Two minutes. Two minutes. To talk to. We're going to pretend you've got one of the students in front of you, and you want to pour into, deposit into the student something that life has taught you that you believe will help them to be successful. Can you craft that for me? I suppose um, over, I don't know, the 40-some years I've been doing this, it's, you first off, I'm not going to quit, and I'm not going to go away. So whether you like it or not, we're going to do this. And then once I have a relationship, albeit as fragile as it might be, mm -hmm. the first question I would ask them, particularly when I was working at the girls' school, I'd sit there and say, tell me your story. Okay. He says, what do you mean your story? He says, you have a story. Mm -hmm. She goes, I don't know, because they're mostly girls. I don't know what you mean. He said, I have to believe that when you were eight years old and dreaming about your future, that sitting downstairs here in, at the photo lab in front of an old guy in a chair in a boarding school for girls with problems was not what you had dreamt of when you were nine years old. Okay. No, it wasn't. All right. Tell me the story. Okay. So you opened the doors to their hearts. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story. You took them back to a point where they could dream. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and say, okay, w w somewhere along the line, this took a left turn. And yeah. then another. And then another. And okay. The Vision Quest people taught me that um, we boiled down the issues of youth to three things. Abuse, mm -hmm. abandonment, and boundaries. Mm -hmm. And they all play on each other. They do. They really do. And once you, to break that triangle, you have to deal with one end. And once you deal with one end, you get all the others. Well... Uh, I'll tell you, this conversation sounds like more to me. <laughs> and since I get to see Bill, maybe I can twist his arm and he can come back and get more specific about buffaloes and big ships and other things <laughs> like that. Would you do that? Sure. I would like that. I, um, I love to close out my program each uh, week by uh, leaving you with some thoughts. And today I've chosen, since we've been talking about young people, I want to talk about and talk to my young listeners. Um, those of you who think you may know what you know, and those of you who are still searching, this is for the days when you feel uninspired, tired, or even depressed. I want you to know that I'm here for you. I want you to know you're worthy, and you're not your circumstances. You have everything you need inside of you to become who you were meant to be. You may have been waiting to receive good news, but I want you to know today you are the good news. So I'm putting on my mother hat and I'm wrapping you in a big hug while you listen to the lyrics of one of my favorite songs. I heard Barbara Streisand sing this many years ago. 
and it touched my heart, and I hope it'll touch yours now. It's called If I Could. If I could, I'd protect you from the sadness in your eyes, give you courage in a world of compromise. Yes, I would. If I could, I would teach you all the things I've never learned, and I'd help you cross the bridges I've burned. Yes, I would if I could. I would try to shield your innocence from time, but the part of life I gave you, it isn't mine. I watched you grow so I could let you go. If I could, I would help you make it through the hungry years, but I know that I could never cry your fear, your tears, but I would if I could. If I could live in a time and space where you don't want to be, you don't have to walk along this road with me. My yesterday won't have to be your way if I knew how. I'd try to change the world I brought you to, but there isn't very much I can do. But I would if I could. Please understand that your seat at the table is guaranteed every week. If you miss us, there we are on YouTube, Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. I want to thank my co-host, Mr. Bill Knopp. I, uh, I'm excited, and I'm going to allow you to enjoy the music of the mood. Take good care. Bye now.